Hey man. Okay. What does the Battle of Hastings have to tell us about the modern militia or about the functioning of the militia? Or what about, what about the militia at all? I mean, it's the Battle of Hastings for crying out loud. What does it have to tell us? Cue the intro. <laughs> Alright, so the Battle of Hastings and how does it applies to the modern day militia. So, uh, some of you might not recognize the Battle of Hastings. So, so just a quick history, and there's going to be a lot of history in this, I apologize. Uh, this does apply to the militia, so stick with me. The Battle of Hastings and the events surrounding it are fascinating. Uh, it's one of those historical events I just can't read enough about. So here we go. The Battle of Hastings is uh, October, uh, I think it's October 14th actually, uh, 1066. Uh, it's, what happens is uh, William the Conqueror lands at Pevin actually he lands at Pevensey Beach in like September 25th or September 28th or something, uh, and he's invading England. He's this this Norman guy, this Norman king, and uh, when you think of the Normans, you that's who you think of when you think of knights and castles. These are the Normans are like they're the ones who started all this stuff and kicked it off. Uh, they're big into all of it, and they're going to invade England, which in 1066 is run by the Anglo-Saxons, were the ones who came over in like the 650s and ran the Celts out and took over. Uh, so what does this have to do with uh, the militia? Well, here we go. I, I'm not quite sure where to start with all this. Uh, like I said, I love it and, and I, I've, I've read a lot about it, so I've got all these, these facts and details running around in my head and I might get them flipped, flipped flopped around, but stick with me. So uh, the Anglo-Saxons were, uh, had been ruling England for uh, like 350, 400 years at that, like 350 years at that point. Uh, and these were the guys that came in, they were slavering, raging, pagan, murderous, rapists, pillaging, burning, they were terrible, they were awful. Uh, and it was the Anglo-Saxons who, who the, the King Arthur, the Arthurian legends, King Arthur was, you know, he was fighting the Anglo-Saxons. Uh, but they come in, like I said, around the, the, the mid 600s or 500s, I don't, and they run out the Celts and they establish this, their, the Anglo-Saxon kingdom, the Angles, the Saxons, and the Jutes. These are northern Germanic tribes. Uh, they were right below where the Vikings were. Uh, and the Saxons f had been involved in like fighting the Romans and the Franks for years, uh, centuries. And then they, they teamed up with the Angles and, and some, there's some people called the Jutes and they come to take over England. All right, so why is this important? What's this have to do with the militia? Now, okay, remember what I said about the Normans. Now, okay, so let's talk about the Normans real quick. Uh, the Normans were descendants of the Vikings. If you've watched that show Viking, the Vikings, uh, there's a character in there called Rollo who goes and sacks Paris. Well, that's a historical figure. Uh, and after he sacks Paris, now maybe he didn't sack Paris, but he, maybe he besieged. Anyway, he's, he's trash in Paris. And uh, the King of France at the time, a guy named Charles the Simple, pretty sure it's Charles the Simple. I may get some of this stuff flipped around. Like, bear with me. He decides instead of having these Vikings trash France for him, he just gives them a whole slice of France up there in the northwest corner facing uh, off the, if, you know, it faces off to England. You know, it includes, uh, uh, what's that damn town that England controlled for so long? That's where the tunnel is now. I can't remember that. can't come up off the, but it includes that too. All, all that northwest corner face in England and he gives this to these Vikings and these Vikings take it and they convert to Christianity and they try to become more French than the French uh, but they, they kind of can't give up their Viking ways and they're, they're in constantly constant warfare constant battle and this guy uh, comes to power called William he will become called William the Conqueror before he conquers England he's called William the Bastard because uh, he was technically illegitimate uh, but Man, he's got he's got a crazy life. He's his own story. We're not going to talk about him. What we need to know about William the Bastard, about to be William the Conqueror, when our story's done here, is he has a a large, very modern army with only it's only about 50% infantry, and then it's about 25% cavalry, real cavalry, but people who fight off the horseback. You know, there's there's mounted infantry that ride their horses to a battle and then get off and fight on the ground, and then there's there's cavalry that ride actually ride their horses into combat. And they're about 25% uh, cavalry and 25% archers. Uh, and through, through a long, complicated series of events, William the Conqueror thinks he, he has claim to the throne of England. 
and he actually does have a, a little bit of a claim to the throne to England. In the meanwhile, there's this actual real Viking, an actual Viking called Harold Hadrada, who's considered the last Viking king, uh, and this is kind of marks the end of the Viking era. Harold Hadrada, who also has this amazing, interesting life, who's a who's his whole story into himself. Uh, both these guys could be movies made about their lives, and actually, William the Conqueror has, uh, and I'm not sure why Harold Hadrada hasn't. Harold Hadrada, uh, he's the king of Denmark or Norway. I can't remember which. He's he's the king of one of them, and he's trying to be the king of other. Decides. He wants to assert his claim to the throne of England. So both these guys are down here with claims to the throne of England, and the English king takes, decides this moment to die. Uh, the English king at this time was a guy named Edward the Confessor, uh, and uh, he was kind of a weak king as far as I can tell. Uh, I'm not a historian, someone else may. But he'd been, he'd been dominated for years by this guy named uh, Godmanson. And I can't remember. There was a father and a son, and the son's name was Harold Godmanson. And I can't remember if the father's name was Harold Godwinson or not. Anyway, but but the old the old man had had run the king for years. Uh, they controlled the bottom third of England, uh, called Wessex. Wessex, yeah. I'm not sure why it was called Wessex at that part. Why why, why would it been called Sussex? I don't know. But it was called Wessex, uh, and it was the old kingdom of the West Saxons is why they called it Wessex. Uh, so Edward the Confessor dies. Now. Now, in the Anglo-Saxons, and here's kind of the linchpin of the story, and when we start getting into the militia, please forgive me for taking this long to get here. Uh, the Anglo-Saxons were, were organized, uh, what I would call, were, were a militia. Their society was organized like a militia. Uh, you know, when they first came to England, every man was a, was a warrior. Because they were, they were an invading force. Uh, and uh, they were called uh, churls. And it wasn't a uh, it wasn't an insult back then. A churl was just a working man who had a spear, and he you know he had a like a homestead, and and he got called out. They called they didn't call it the militia. They called it the feared, the F Y R D. But it's the exact same thing. It's a militia. It works just like a militia. Every man's a part of it, or most men were a part of it. Uh, and if something happened, they got called out. Okay. So, the, in, in the Anglo in the Anglo Saxon England, kings weren't hereditary. It didn't go from father to oldest son. Uh, when a king died, there was something called the Witan. I think that's the right way to pronounce it. It's spelled W-I-T-A-N. And the Witan got together and elected the new king. And it would frequently be the old king's son, but it didn't have to be. It could be any of his male relatives. It could be a whole other family. It could be any anyone who was considered noble. I think they had a name for some people who are eligible for the throne. And I think it was Athling or Halfling, but I, I'm way off the edges of the map here, so I'm, I may be wrong about that. Uh, so, the Anglo-Saxon culture was a little, a little bit more democratic, maybe than than others. You know, with with everyone was armed, everyone was part of the military. You know, there wasn't a warrior class uh, like so many of those feudal societies. There was this warrior class that lorded it over everyone else. The Anglo-Saxons were everyone was a warrior, and and that that had profound effects on their culture, and it still echoes in uh, in the cultures that they affected to this day. Uh, so the Anglo-Saxons are a malicious society. Now you've got this slavering Viking horde to the north that once, oh, I'm sorry, we're, let's get back to Harold Godwinson. Harold Godwinson's a neat guy. Uh, his life isn't quite as interesting as William or the other Harold Hadratus, but he's still pretty cool. He's Harold Godwinson. He, when Edward the Confessor dies, Edward was married to Harold's sister. Uh, you know, the Wheatan elects Harold Godwinson king. Now Ed, William the Conqueror thinks he's supposed to be king. He says Edward Confessor told him years ago he could be king, which is ridiculous because the king didn't get to pick his successor in England, in, in, in England, in the Anglo-Saxon lands. That was ridiculous. I think they called it England at this point. Uh, uh, so that, that that doesn't make any stinking sense at all. Harold Hadrada says that he has a claim from back when uh, uh, the Vikings ruled the north of England, the Danelaw, and he has a claim back from there. And it's kind of silly. He's just a Viking. And, you know, he wants to go to war, and he just puts this thin legal veneer over it. So now we've got this, this slavering Viking horde from the north, and this barely refined Viking horde from the southwest, southeast. And, and they both want to come and take the crown of England. And here's Harold Godwinson sitting in there with his, his militia uh, organized society. Uh, so... This is, this is all happening in the year 1066. 1066 is a big year in the history of the world, a huge history, year in the history of the world. It's still, like I said, it still echoes today. 
and, and those, those societies derived from, from England, you know, America, uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, yeah, New Zealand a little bit, uh, you know, all, all those places, South Africa, Hong Kong, and anything that, any place that's been India, any place that's been affected by England uh, has echoes in their society that go back to this event in 1066. All right, so, so Harold Hadrada is coming from the north with 300 ships, and uh, William the Conqueror's, uh, well, well, basically, Harold, Harold knows William's coming. He, Harold Goodwinson, the king of England, knows that William's coming, but he doesn't know about Hadrada, the Viking coming from the north. So he's sitting down in, in south, southeast England waiting for William the Conqueror, who's got like 8,000 guys on the beach just waiting to come, but the weather's not cooperating with him. He can't get the wind to go right so he can cross the channel. So, so Harold Goodwinson knows he's coming. You know, he can almost see him from where he's sitting. You know, the channel is pretty narrow. Uh, and he gets word that 300 Viking ships have landed <laughs> up near York. Uh, and I uh, don't remember, I believe, you know, it, these numbers are all real soft. No one knows for sure how big these armies were, but I think the best guess is that there were 9,000 of these Vikings, and uh, they, they, they kicked the crap out of... Uh, these two earls that are up there near York in the, in the north of England. And Harold Hadrada goes 200 miles. He, he has this, so you know, we're talking about a militia society here, so there's no standing armor, right? Well, he's got this, this corps called these house, these house, house carls? I'm gonna say that wrong. Who's, who's carls? They're, they're like, they're this core of a, a real professional hardcore fighters. So he disband, he had to disband the militia down in, in the south east he hears about these vikings him and his who's carls march almost 200 miles in four or five days we're not sure which but he basically averaged almost 40 miles a day uh and and surprised this 9,000 strong uh viking army up around york he gets there with his who's carls and just calls up gets the feared to come out whatever feared he can get to come out right there where he's at and they attack this great Viking horde, the last great Viking army, uh, the last Viking king. This is the end of the Viking Age, and there's this this kind of dramatic battle at this place called Stamford Stamford Bridge, uh, and there's this neat <laughs> this neat. I'm, a, I'm taking too long. I'm sorry, but I'm gonna tell the story anyway. Uh, earlier, Harold Godwinson had run off his brother because his brother was being stupid, and his brother had linked up with the Viking Hadrada, uh, and uh, right before this battle. This guy comes over from the Saxon side and just rides right across the battlefield and rides right up to Harold, Harold Godwinson's brother and says, uh, you know, what will you take to switch sides? And uh, the, the, the brother's name is Tostig, and he says, oh, what, I don't care about me, but what are you going to give my Viking buddy over here? And, uh, and the guy who rode over says, six feet of good English ground, uh, more if he needs it, because apparently Hadrada was tall. And then he just turns around and drives back, and it turns out that's, that was the king of England. That was... King Harold Godwinson. Uh, kind of a fun story. He rode right up. Uh, Tostic was sitting right next to the Viking king, Harold Hadrada, uh, and he just rode right up to him and tried to get his brother to come back to his side. Uh, they, they win this battle. It's a dramatic battle. It's an interesting battle. Stamford Bridge. Look it up. I won't go all into it. Uh, and then he turns around and takes a week to get back down to London. At some point on his way back down to London, he hears that William the Conqueror got the, the wins he won. And he, he came across the channel uh, and landed at Pevensey Beach, which I think is at Hastings. I think that's the town right there. Uh, so Hadrada left the, not Hadrada, I'm sorry, Hadrada's dead. Harold Godwinson left the feared up there at the battle in York, takes his hoose carls, and they book it right back down to Hastings. They stopped in London for a week, and he goes down to the Hastings. Now, here's what we've got. We've got this English king, King Harold, uh, who's got his hoose carls, which there's not that many of them, and they just fought, they've just been 200 miles north and back again in the space of three weeks, I think is what it is. Uh, and they call up the, the, whatever fear they can get right there around Hastings, and, and they're going to try to go and, and bottle up William the Conqueror at, in Hastings. And they go to this hill. Ah, oh, I forgot the name of the hill. It's like Selden or something, Seldak or Selak or Sel... Anyway, I won't try to. Uh, and the thing is, Hastings is on this like spit of land, and if they can bottle up uh, Cotton William there, then they can keep him from breaking out into the country and causing havoc and going wherever he wants. Uh, so you've got this Norman army 
which is they've got 50% infantry, 25% uh, uh, archers, 25% real heavy ca heavy cavalry. These are knights with lances and shields and, and whatnot. Uh, and you've got a bunch of Anglo-Saxon farmers with, uh, with axes and spears and shields uh, and some chain mail. Uh, so you've got a modern professional army. These, these were the, the cream of northern France and France and Brittany and Britain and somewhere else. The actual Vikings, I think, were with them too. Uh, the, these were the warrior class of Europe, uh, all of France and all that stuff. Uh, and they were coming to fight a bunch of English farmers. The, the Normans and, and their allies had, like I said, heavy cavalry, they had crossbows, they, had, uh, they didn't have long bows, but they had real regular bows. Uh, they, they had the cream of military technology for the time and modern tactics, and, and they had to just get past a couple of, far, not a couple, there was probably, they were similarly sized armies, but they just had to get past a few thousand farmers with spears, mixed with a few hardcore warriors mixed in who had already been all the way up north, fought a major battle, and come all the way back south. Uh, this should have been a walk in the park. Uh, so now, spoiler alert, England loses the Battle of Hastings. We, we, they, they lost, uh, but just barely. So what happens is uh, the, the feared, the militia, the English militia, gets up on a hill, and uh, they're able to, to sort of negate the... Uh, uh, advantage of the cavalry. The cavalry can't charge them. Uh, they were able to put up a shield wall uh, so the, the horses didn't want to like... Uh, between the shield wall and the hill, the horses were negated and the archers were negated because of the angle. So they were, it was hard for... They were either shooting into the shield or over the whole English army and over the back side of the hill. Uh, they're holding. Not only holding, but they're holding good. <laughs> I mean, they're doing well. Uh, a couple of things start happening and, and there's a few different explanations for this and I'm just going to talk about what affects us in the militia. So the feared, the, the English militia, uh, something happens and different people will tell you different things where either the Normans are retreating or the Normans were retiring to, uh, to take a rest or it was a trap where they acted like they were running to try to draw out the feared. Well whatever happened, the, the English feared thought they were winning and they tried to attack the cavalry from behind and kill them before they could get away. Uh, and it was a trick or whatever it was, the, the, the Norman cavalry was able to swing around and attack them now that they were down off the hill and out of formation. And, and they didn't destroy the whole, it wasn't the end of the battle, but it greatly weakened the, the English on the hill, uh, King Harold. Now they keep holding out and the, and the, the Normans keep doing this. It was a, it's a tactic. They either developed it here or they brought it here from other battles, but they kept trying to do this. They kept trying to pretend to show their back and try to get the English to charge and to finish them off and then turn around. Anyway, this battle starts at 9 in the morning and it goes all the way to sundown. Uh, and th and this, this English militia holds, holds against the, uh, like this modern, uh, heavily equipped army until sometime in the afternoon, King Harold takes an, an arrow to the eyeball, we think, we're not sure. Uh, some people say he took an arrow to the eyeball, some people say he got killed by a sword, some people say he got wounded in the eye and then killed by the sword. Doesn't matter. King Harold dies, the feared breaks and runs. Uh, uh, and it's not, it's not clear if they, to me, now I'm not a historian, I'm just reading this stuff. To me, when I read the accounts, it's not clear that had Harold not died, that the feared would have lost that day, that they wouldn't have held. Because uh, they, were, they were holding and they'd lasted all day. Uh, and, and time was on the England side. They just had to hold William up there for a while until these earls up north decided to get off their butts and get down there and, 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 and help. Uh, but so, so, so the militia was going to hold, but then they didn't, and they, and they lost this battle. So you know, that, that would kind of imply to us that you know, maybe the militia is not effective. But here's what happens next. And this, this, this unfolded over several hundred years. The Normans take over the country and, and they replace most of the English nobles, almost all the English nobles, with Norman nobles. Norman, French, you know, Britons, Brittany, all these uh, Britons, not, not Britain, but Britons and Brittany, which isn't Britain. They replace all the nobles, all the people at the top get replaced. But the culture underneath survives. The feared maybe lost that battle, but the culture was so strong 
and, and everyone was still armed, that, that even though there was this turnover at the top, the people survived. And actually what ends up happening is the Anglo-Saxons subsume the Normans. And it's only a few hundred years later that no one will even admit to being Norman anymore. Uh, because So what happens is, uh, and you all know these stories, you may not know you know them, so Robin Hood. Robin Hood is a Saxon, uh, and King John is a Norman, uh, and uh, Richard the Lionheart, his, his brother, was a Norman. Uh, but, but the Norman oppressors, and if you've ever read the book Ivanhoe, and if you have not read the book Ivanhoe, you must read the book Ivanhoe. Uh, this is that same story, Ivanhoe set around Robin Hood too. The, the Saxons maintain their pride, they maintain uh, on, on the lower level a lot of their possessions, they maintain their arms, and their culture survives, and they end up eating the Normans from the bottom, and the Normans just either, either just dissipate into the culture, uh, and and they are no more uh, in England. Now, there's, well, they were, they kind of ended up everywhere. Uh, so, so while this militia lost that battle, just barely, by the way, it won the war. You know, it, it took a long time, but these armed men who had this idea that they were freed men who, who had weapons and who were responsible for the safety and security and prosperity of their families and community, even though they lost the battle, they won that war. Uh, you know, it's called England today. It's not called Norman land. Uh, you know, they've got the king, queen of England. Uh, we still speak English. You know, in the Norman language, French didn't take over uh, England. It, it, the English culture and the English people survived. And you don't, where are the Normans anymore? You know, there's still Normandy. Uh, and you've, that's Normandy is what's left of that. Uh, Norman was from Norse, Northmen or Norsemen, uh, you know, Vikings from the north, men from the north, and, and you know, and they took over Normandy and we stormed the beaches and everything. Uh, that, that's where all this happened. Uh, but, but even though the, the militia was outgunned, uh, I, I, I don't know if they were outmanned or not, but they're definitely outgunned, outmaneuvered. Uh, and they weren't professional warriors. They, they, still, they still stood up to that aggression and they survived. Now, real historians may argue with me and tell me I'm stupid, but, but take that and apply it, okay? Take it and apply it to us. Uh, we're not professional warriors. Some of us have been or whatnot, but for the most part, we're farmers and accountants and you know, factory workers. Uh, but, but the precedent is there in our past for us to say we don't, we don't have, we don't have to, to be afraid of the Normans. Uh, we can stand up to the Normans. Uh, there's so much more we could take out of this Battle of Hastings. I know I've gone on too long. Mariah's falling asleep behind the camera. I'm sorry that this has taken so long, uh, but it's a fascinating story, and it applies to us today. Uh, if, you've not, if you're not familiar with the Battle of Hastings or any of these characters, Harold Godwinson, Harold Hadrada, William the Conqueror, uh, Tostig, uh, who was uh, Edward the Confessor, this is a fascinating fascinating moment in history. There's a really good podcast that, that called The History of England that talks about a lot of this stuff if you want to just listen to it. Uh, you, there's some episodes called Edward the Confessor or William the Con you know, you'll, It's easy to see, 1066. Uh, but history is on our side, men. <laughs> uh, if we know our history, uh, we, we, it can inspire us. That's how the Battle of Hastings can inform the militia today. I'm sorry I went so long, men. We appreciate you. Thank you.